morning we're talking about Jesus. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. If you're young, you like him to be the first to you. If you're a little older, you like to know he's going to be the end to you. He's everything in between. Isn't that glorious? Thank you, Jesus. Well, I'm going to be brief this morning because I feel like we glorify Jesus in this house. You know, that's what we're to do is to glorify him and the testimonies and uh, your hearts of compassion is the testimony and glorifies the Lord. And if we don't have any other message today but to go into the highways and the byways and compel them to come in. You know, that's the message of Jesus. And if he lives in us, people need to see him in us. And the first thing they will see in us is if we have a countenance of Christ. Do you ever hear somebody tell you they're a Christian and you didn't know it because you could never tell it because it didn't show? How many know what I'm saying? Yes. But when we have the countenance of Christ, when we have that smile on our face that says, I'm open to you and I, I'll hear what you have to say and, and Christ lives in me and it's not all a hellfire and damnation and it's not all going down the tube, but Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's the Alpha and the Omega. So I want to talk briefly today, just a minute, about the origin of Jesus. You know, we're living in a day when um, the media and the newspapers and all these things that's happening in our earth, you know, we need to know Jesus, who he is, where he came from, why we serve him, and we need to have him on our lips because he is going to be the only help that we have in the days ahead. And I like to talk about his origin. He was in the beginning. I think everyone here has heard this passage of scripture, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. And it sounds good and it's encouraging. We like to hear it. But he's more than the Alpha and the Omega. Alpha means he was there in the beginning of all things. Is that in scripture? Yes, it is. It's in scripture. The Bible says that he was the lamb slain from the foundations of the world. Can you imagine when Job wrote about the morning stars singing together? It says there in Job that when the foundations was fastened. I can't even imagine what that means. But he says when the foundations were fastened, the morning stars sang together and Jesus was there. He was there in the midst of that. And Jesus is all through the Old Testament. He didn't just arrive in the New Testament. But he is all through the Old Testament. They prophesied of his birth. They, they, they prophesied of his death. They prophesied that there would be a star. On and on and on through the Old Testament. The psalmist David cries out for salvation. And the Messiah and the King of Kings, and the Lord of Lords. And then we get over into the New Testament, and in Hebrews they said, all the prophets and all those that wrote about him and talked about him, they didn't see him. You know, they didn't get the promise. But how many know we have the promise? Amen. In the New Testament, he came. He walked among us. He, he died and he rose again. And he has a history from the beginning of time until the end of time. Yeah. He's the Alpha and the Omega. Yeah. I want us to see that he was there and he was in the beginning with God. He was the Lamb that was slain. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, God's plan went into motion. And I can see it now. He turned to Jesus and he said, I'm going to need a Savior. I'm going to need a sacrifice. I'm going to have to have a sacrificial lamb that will take away the sins of the world. And from the beginning of time, Jesus was the plan of our salvation. How important is that to the church today? To know that he was in heaven with the Father, robed in the robes of righteousness, never had a pain in his life. And he sacrificed himself to come and suffer in all ways like we have suffered. 
that he might be our redeemer. And somebody said, well, you know, we go through these hard places and these disappointments and these sicknesses and all of these trials and temptations, but he has gone before us. Right. And he is the beginning of everything and he's the end of everything. And he will bring us through. And he said in his word in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am there you may be also. So why do we embrace discouragement and despondency? And why do we embrace those down times? And why do we think sometimes that we're just not worth anything and yet we're the righteousness of God in Christ? He has created us and we are a part of Him. And no matter how young or how old we are, we have a position in Christ and He's gone to prepare a place for us and we have a destiny. Somebody looks at their life and they say, I have nothing. But we have a destiny in Christ. We have a place that he is preparing for us that in the end of all things we don't just go into oblivion. Mm -hmm. But we walk through the valley of the shadow of death and he's the shepherd that walks with us and it's an avenue into eternal life and we have a place that he has prepared for us. It's important, church, to notice this. It's important to realize that we are a blessed people. We sit here in the church today, we are clothed, we're in our right mind, we have the power of Christ in us, and we have a place to go, and that is to Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of our faith. He didn't just author these things, but he finished them on Calvary. Remember, he said, it is done. It is finished. And Father, I give everything into your hands. And church, sometimes when we feel crucified and when we feel that we're going through hard times and desperate situations and seasons when we can't feel the presence of God, we need to say, Father, I give myself into your hands. Amen. And it is finished because I am in you and you are in yes. me and we are one in our Father God. So. Does the church know this? Yes. We need to know this. God needs to have a remnant of his church that's saved, sanctified, filled with the Holy Ghost, and ready to do his work no matter the, the crisis or no matter the circumstances in our life. The enemy works on us as we grow older. The enemy works on the youth to destroy them. My Robin is only 45, 46, 47 years old. The enemy works on the young to bring destruction. And he works on the old to make us discouraged and despondent. But you know what? Christ is the author and the finisher of all things. And it's not over until he says it's over. And it's not finished until he says it's finished. And when it is finished, we have eternal life. And what's so bad about eternal life? Oh, it's awesome. He's the author and the finisher of everything. Well, I want us to see his origin. I want us to know that he was there in the beginning of time. And everything that God is, is in Christ. Paul wrote and he says, we sit in heavenly places in Christ. He was the beginning. He is. He was. He always shall be. The devil likes to, to tempt us with discouragement and desolation. And that we haven't reached our hope. And he likes to... Uh, di cause discouragement in us because of the losses in our life and because of things that didn't transpire in our life and because of this and because of that and he hounds us and he works on us and he chews away at the little vines to spoil our lives but God is greater than that because he lives in us and we have a power and an anointing of his presence that uh, is in us and if we will avail it he will use us to the last breath we take because he's the author and the finisher of all things. He's the first and the last, the alpha and the omega. He's God. He's sovereign. He's our savior. John 16. We'll go there today for brevity's sake. John 16. And this tells us how did Jesus get here? Where did he come from? Did anybody ever ask you that? They said, well, you believe in God. How did all that happen? I want you to know how it happened. In John 16, 27, it says that the Father himself loves you. 
Does the church know that today? The Father himself loves you. And he loves you because, guess what? Because you love Jesus. You see that? It's in this passage of scripture. For the Father himself loveth you because ye have loved me. It's Jesus talking. And he says, because you love me, the Father loves you. I don't even think we comprehend that sometimes. You know, that we must love Jesus to get all the benefits of eternal life. I've heard people say, well, I, I believe in God. You know, but you have to believe in Jesus. Yes. Because Jesus is the door opener to eternal life. You have to love him so that the Father will love you. It's important. That's why we're talking about Jesus. Because we want to invigorate our Christian life in Jesus. So that we can get into the benefits of all that God has promised his people. So he says that, you know, God loves you because you love me. And here's what he says. He says, and have believed that I came from God. I came forth from the Father. Do you ever wonder where Jesus come from? He says here, I came forth from the Father, and I came into the world, and again I leave the world and go to the Father. Now, the world can't understand that. The, the world can't understand that. The world will question you. If you get into any kind of discussion or debate with the world, they will question you. They're doing it all the time. I don't know if you catch the things on TV, but they're talking against God. They're talking against Christ. And, that you know, they got Noah coming out, and it's not biblical at all. And I tell you this, of a truth church, we have to have a discerning spirit to know what is of Christ and what is not of Christ. And Jesus said we have to love him. If we love him, the Father loves us. So now here we see the Alpha and the beginning. The Bible says, I came out from God, I came forth from the Father. He's the Alpha, he's the beginning, he's the Lamb slain from the foundations of the world. And John wrote this, he was the beloved of the Lord, and he educates us. John educates us as to who Jesus is. He says, in the beginning was what? was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God, and all things were made by Him, and without Him was nothing made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the life of men. Now, I'm telling the church this this morning. You can, if you believe in God, it will not get you to heaven. You must believe in Christ. You must come through the blood of Jesus. There's a whole world out there that goes to church and believes in God. But it's only going to happen if you believe in Jesus and if you love Jesus because what does the scripture say? It says, in him is life. And the life was the light of man. So, eternal life is in Christ. In the Old Testament, it was if they, if they killed the lamb, if they obeyed this, the traditions of the law, all that was important, and all that worked for the Old Testament saints. The New Testament saints, what works for us is loving Jesus. If we love Jesus, God loves us, and Jesus is the one that's preparing the place for us. And the scripture tells us it's so plain. It says it, he was there in the beginning. He is the word, and, and everything that was made was him. You know, sometimes Christians don't comprehend that. Sometimes they just think that, you know, Jesus came and died and that's it. But no, he was in the beginning. His origin, he came from the Father. We need to know this because in the days ahead we will be questioned. We will have dis discussions and debates and we need to have an answer <coughs> to, to what they ask us. We need to be able to turn over and say, well, let's look at John 16. And here we see that the Bible tells us where Jesus came from. That he was in the origin, that, that he was in the beginning with the Father. And if you don't love Jesus, you can't get into heaven. Right. Life is in Christ. You know, I was just, I, I know that, but as I read that, it was like the Holy Spirit just turned the light on a little brighter. And I began to realize, because you know, I've done multitudes of funerals. And I always ask, does this man know Christ? Yeah. And many times I get the answer, well, he believed in God. You know, and I think, okay, well, he believes in God. But, you know, right here, this passage of Scripture is telling us that we have to love Jesus and that Jesus is the life. He's the eternal life. 
So it's very, very important. So in the beginning, he was there. He was the Word and everything that was made. Can't you see him standing with the Father as the Father began to create the animals, as the Father began to create humanity? Whatever the Father did, he was there. And he was singing with the morning stars as the foundation was laid because he was there from the foundation of the world. I believe in this moment in time that we need to be able to evaluate who Christ truly is, that he is more than just the man. You know, they have uh, the, the television programs about Jesus. And all, every time they have one about Jesus, then they have one that's a little obnoxious against him. They're trying to take away the robe of Turin, or whatever you call that, you know, where Jesus' face is. They're working on that. The, the, there's new manuscripts coming out that, that discredits Christ. And this is the day and the hour when we need to have the, the purest word of God that we know, and we need to know it. We need to have devotions. You know, if you just read a little, the, the little devotion book we have, that's not enough, church. You need to get in and read the scripture. Read John 16 this week and read all the side notes. Read all the side notes. Stop and, and meditate on it and be systematic with the word of God. Here's what's happening. The people have listened to the preacher and never gone to study for themselves. And I tell you this, and I, and I love you, and I want you to have knowledge. The knowledge doesn't come because, you know, you went to college. The knowledge comes because you love the Word of God, because the Word of God is Christ. Yes. And when you love Christ, then you want to know more about Him. So then you read more about Him. And when you read, you know, something like this, well, He came out from God, well, how did that happen? Let me go over here, let me study. Remember, the study notes are not the Bible. But the study notes uh, embrace more knowledge. And then they'll tell you to go someplace else. And then you can follow it someplace else. And before you know it, two hours will have passed, and you'll be shocked that you've been studying for two hours. But church, that's what it's going to take for this last day. We have to know about Jesus. Because he's the light and he's the life. I was mused at Roxy because she, I said, now honey, you have to ask him if he knew the Lord. Now see, I didn't even encourage her right because I should have said you have to ask him if he knows Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. You know, and she said, okay, I have to do that. Oh, yes, you have to do that. Because you, you've got to preach a sermon. You've got to know that, you know. And so she asked, she came back. And this was staggering to me. This, this is what she said to me. She said, well, he's, he knows God, but I'm not sure that works. <laughs> and that was a revelation. And then I thought of this message. And I thought of what John said. John said, you know what? He is the life. The life, the eternal life, is in Jesus Christ. I said, oh, honey, you're right. From now on, ask, does he know Jesus Christ? Because the world will say they know God. They'll wear the crucifix. They'll wear the cross. They'll say they know God. They'll say they know a creator. This movie Noah, they don't talk about God. They talk about a creator. See what I'm saying, church? Yes. See, we know who the Creator is, but the world doesn't know who the Creator is. Yes. The higher power. We know who the higher power yes. is, but who is the higher power to the world who don't know the higher power? Yes. We need to know Jesus. We need to get scholarly in the Word of God. Well, I skipped two pages, and so i got to find my place. <laughs> Isaiah said, in Isaiah 28, 16, he says, Therefore thus saith the Lord, Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Now, to anybody that read that, that doesn't mean what we're, what we're going to say it means. If you know Jesus, you know what it's talking about. Because he's the foundation, he's the stone, He's the cornerstone, and it's about him. He's over there in Isaiah, and Isaiah has no idea what he's prophesying. Did you ever prophesy, and you think, Lord, I hope that was you, because I have no idea. But you speak the word, and let the Lord take it where he wants to take it. 
And Isaiah prophesied this, and then the scripture says, you know what? He never saw the promise. But we are a, we are a privileged people because we have seen the Christ. You know, it's it's it, there are witnesses that they saw Christ. Christ is not a myth. They saw him. They testified. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, 12 disciples walked with him. They touched him. They handled him. They saw the nail print in his hands. He was a being. We need to know him in that kind of passion. Isaiah said, well, he, he's a foundation. He's a stone. He's a cornerstone. And Ephesians 2.20 bears it out. We get over there and it says, we are built, you and I, we are built upon the foundation of the apostles, the prophets, and Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. We are built because the prophets obeyed God and prophesied of the Messiah. I mean, they had it hard because they had to prophesy about something that they never saw. But they were faithful to do it. And now we're built upon what they did because now we see the, the result and the promise of the Messiah, for he has come. So it says we are built upon the foundation, Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. And, and I can't help but hear Peter. He, I iterates this in 1 Peter 2.6. You know, Peter, when he got saved, he really got saved. Yes. And he walked with Jesus, and Jesus had to say, wait a minute, Peter, you know, you don't have salvation. He said, but I'll pray for you, and when you get it, something will change in your life. And now, we read what he says, 1 Peter 2, 6, he says, Therefore also it is contained in Scripture. How many know that Peter did his homework? Yes. He'd been reading Isaiah. He says, it is contained in scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. He was that robust, uh, flamboyant Peter that said, Lord, I'll follow you all the way. And he stood up tough and said, I will do this. And Jesus said, wait a minute, Peter. He said, I pray for you that when you're converted, and you know what? He turned from being that robust know-it-all to saying, look, he's precious. I mean, can you imagine Peter saying something so soft and so passionate and so kind? He said, to, you know, he is precious. He is the cornerstone. Let's talk about Jesus, church. Let's talk about our Savior. Let's talk about our Redeemer. Let's tell the world what he did in our life that changed us. Yes. Let's talk about the miracles. Let's talk about the things wherein he touched our lives. You know, when they ask a question, and if we have any kind of response at all, I mean, somebody was telling me, Somebody asked them, well, how are you doing? And they, they was out in the world, and they responded, well, I'm doing fine in Jesus. Let's get Jesus out there. Because people want to know about him. There is a hurting world out there that's looking for drugs, looking for alcohol, looking for all the things of the world to calm that passion that they have in them because God has created them with a passion for the Almighty. Amen. Hebrews 12, 2. This is another voice that vindicates Christ. He says, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. Sounds like the Alpha and the Omega, doesn't it? Yeah. It says, the author and the finisher of our faith. You know, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. I want to tell you something. Jesus took away our shame. That's right. The shame of our sin. Yes. The shame of degradation. The shame of the things that we did that was wrong. Jesus died to take away That's the right. shame. It says he despised the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And then we hear Peter again in Peter chapter 1, 19 and 20. And he says we are redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus as of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was what? Foreordained before the foundation of the world and is manifested in these last days to you, to me. 
think on that. That just calls for a sila. The precious blood of Jesus. Now church, notice this. Here's how we're redeemed. Not if you believe in God, and, and I don't take away the majesty and the power of God. But I just want to say to you, this is redemption by the precious blood of Jesus. That's how we enter into the throne room, through the precious blood of Jesus. He was the lamb without spot and blemish. It says there, he was foreordained before the foundation of the world. And then he was manifested to us, and we see him die for our sins. Let the church talk about Jesus. Yeah, Let the church talk about the author and the finisher, the first and the last, the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. Over and over and over, it is related to us that everything starts with him. And church, listen to me. Everything ends with him. In Revelation 1, 4 and 8, it says that John brought a message to the church. We are the church. And the message was, grace be unto you. Grace comes at redemption. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is, which was, and which is to come. Think on that. He was. He is, he is to come. If there's anyone here that questions your life, the end of your life, you should know that if you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus, your end is fixed yes. in him. Yes. Now you may go through trial and temptation, you may go through loss, you may go through hurts and disappointments, but your end is is fixed yes. in his shed blood. It's so important, church. Well, he's coming back. Yes. He's coming back. And unless we believe that and look for that, we might miss it. It says, lift up your eyes. Behold, your bridegroom come. Who is that? It's Jesus. it's Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And I love the end of that passage of Scripture because it says he is, he was, he always shall be, he is the Almighty. Yes. Oh, saints, we must, we must step up our conversation about Christ. Yes. You know, they, they take his name in vain all around us. And right there is an opportunity to say, you're talking about my Savior. I've tried that. <laughs> and sometimes you get some hard responses. You know. But why does the world say that? Because there's no name above that name. That's, right. that's why they say it. You know, that's something that you can say to them when they say that. You can say, you know, there's no name above that name. You're using the Almighty's name, and you're not using it appropriately. It's important, church. Paul writes of the Israelites, and I'll come to a conclusion here, but Paul writes about this, and he's writing about Moses and the Israelites in 1 Corinthians 10.4. And he's talking about how the Israelites all drank of, of, of a spiritual drink. And he said, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was who? Jesus. Jesus. So Jesus was with them in the wilderness. He was with them throughout all their disobediences. Does the church hear me? Yes. Sometimes we think we can get away from it, but we can't because the spiritual rock is following us. And he sees us. And if we can be in the closet with the door shut, he still sees us. He's an all-seeing God. 
prophet Isaiah wrote, and he said, and I'm saying this as Christianity today, he said, they have eyes and they don't see, and they have ears and they don't hear. And I want so much for us to hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to us as a church. You know, God is doing something in our midst. He is raising up leaders in this small place. We send the word to the nations. We send the word over 4,000 prisoners now. You know, they're, they're not all on our roll now, but we send the word to them. You know, and you would be amazed at what one individual can do for the kingdom of God. There's a story in the Bible where Jesus sat down at the well with one woman and he gave her that spiritual drink, that crystal water that flows from the throne room of God. And she went out, this little woman who had been polluted by the sins of the world. She was in sin at the moment. Jesus redeemed her and she went from that moment redeemed into the city and the whole city come yes. out to see Jesus. Yes. When we have the countenance of Christ, they will want to know why we're so happy in this world of decline. And when they question us, we can bring them to Jesus. Yes. If you sit at the well with one and appropriately give Jesus to them, there will be a great indwelling of souls for the kingdom of God. Yeah, right. yeah. Hebrews 11, 13. This talks about all the prophets and all those that did not see the promise. It says they all died in faith. That's faith, church. Yes. Faith is not just confessing it and commanding it. That's not faith. Faith is living it. You know, faith is walking through a doctor's report. Faith is walking through poverty. Faith is walking through a trial and a temptation. That's what faith is. Yes. It hasn't got anything to do with money. It has to do with your soul and your spirit and your trust in God. And it said there that, you know, faith, they all died in faith. They never saw the Messiah. They never, Isaiah never saw what he prophesied about. They never saw it. They all died in faith, but guess what? The Bible says they didn't receive the promise, but they all seen them afar off. Yes. I want to say to the church today, when you're discouraged and despondent, you must see the promises of God afar off. You must see eternal life, yes. because that's where we're headed. You know, we're not headed to the grave. Right. We're headed to eternal life. <coughs> So it says they saw him afar off and they were persuaded. Faith is a persuasion. And they were persuaded and they embraced them and they confessed them. They said we're strangers and we're pilgrims. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. You know, we quote that scripture. There's been great studies and books and everything else written on it. But the simplest form of it is having faith to believe that God is going to take you through the circumstance of your life and when you are in a dark place and you don't even want to live his power and his presence will keep you alive yes. and it will bring you through if Jesus lives in you because he's the life yes. and he is the light of the world the New Testament saints, now that was Old Testament, they embraced it, they were persuaded, they walked in faith, they never saw the promise. But now the New Testament, guess what? They walked with the promise. Mm -hmm. They saw the miracles of the promise. Yes. He held out his nail-scarred hands and the Bible says they handled him. He said, handle me and see. They saw the resurrected Lord. Yes. That means there's life after death, church. Yes. They saw him. He wasn't a ghost. He wasn't a cloud. He was Jesus. Yes. Yes. And as soon as he opened their eyes, to, he, they could see him. And they saw he's still Christ. He still looks like him. When we go into eternal life, we'll be who we are. They'll know us. 
We'll know each other. We don't sit on a cloud. We'll have work to do for the kingdom. We'll be busy, church. Let's talk about Jesus. When we get disappointed and disillusioned, you just need to open up the Gospels and talk about Jesus. We talk about where we're going. And we don't want to be detoured by anything. We want to be on time for the coming of the Lord Jesus. He said, the trumpet shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with him. And what? So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the Omega. Yes. Yeah. If you have a sincere Lenten discipline, it will give you an opportunity to talk about Jesus. Trust me. You go to the break room. Everybody's passing out brownies. <laughs> and you have to say, no, I don't want it. You don't want any. You love chocolate. <laughs> <coughs> no, I have a, a Lenten discipline. I am disciplining myself because Christ disciplines his life for me. Mm -hmm. Look for the chances, church, yes. because God is going to give you the opportunity. Yes. If you say to him, give me the opportunity, you'll have so many you won't be able to keep up with. <laughs> Don't you love Jesus? Yes. Remember this, that he is the beginning and the end. See, he gave you life when you came out of your mother's womb. And he's going to be there when he gives you eternal life. And he's going to bring you into his presence. And you know what, church? We can't, we can't slough off one day. Every day we need to be accountable to Christ. Every day, we need to think on him. When we rise in the morning, thank you, Jesus, I woke up. Amen. And when we go to bed at night, thank you, Jesus, that your Holy Spirit will work through me all night. I had to leave out that part. But the Bible says that Jesus told his disciples, he said, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to leave you comfortless, but I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. Now, church, we think about the Holy Spirit as being in tongues. The Holy Spirit is everything else. Yes. He's that, but he's so much more. He's the truth. He's the guide. He's the comforter. He's the one that instructs us. And church, he's the convictor. You want him working in you. So when you start to say, oh, nothing, then you go, oh, no, wait a minute. There's a conviction here. No, it's about Jesus. Tell the world about Jesus. But that's the only way we're going to get into eternal life is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Father, we love you this morning. We hallow your name. And we come to you through the power of your son, Jesus Christ. We pray, Lord, that you'll cause us to be lights shining for your glory. That you'll cause your life to live in us that people can see your life in us. We know that you were our beginning. Lord, let us embrace that you are our omega, that you are our end, that nothing is going to happen to us without you being with us. And you are the end of all things in our life. For this we give you praise. In Jesus' name we ask you.